Carol said that in Mathematical, and we speak about semiotics of toys. So, toys are one of the more ancient artifacts created by man. We found toys from millennia ago, both in Egyptian tombs and in the excavation of the Indus Valley. There is no human civilization that didn't produce toys, and nowadays there are an industrial mass product. Despite their cultural importance, however, toys are generally ignored in academia. A few works exist, but mainly focus on the psychotherapeutic function or the history. Even many play-centered works, as Clewat, Les Jeux et les Hommes, fail to focus properly on toys, with the Ingar and Homo Luden doesn't even mention them. The aim of this paper, therefore, is to promote the establishment of a semiotic theory of toys. The starting point will obviously be a definition of our object of study. What are toys? The simplest definition would be toys are items that can be used for play. This definition, however, introduces a very complicated term, play. The semantic field of the word play is very vast, and according to the definition above, also a violin would be a toy. If we want our analysis to be pertinent, we will have to restrict our definition of play. As we think and many others have shown, the semantic field of play is greatly asymmetric in different languages. For instance, only a few languages use the word play for music or theater. It would be appropriate, then, to exclude from our definition of play all the activities that, even if semantically related to play, are not universally considered playful. As, uh, for example, any form of show, music, theater, cinema, etc., poses and illusions. In the same way, we should exclude all metaphoric uses of the words related to playfulness as, for example, expressions like toy boys. Roger Kewa, even if he did not work on toys, derived a famous typology of play that could help us investigate the different kinds of objects used for play. According to him, four forms of play exist. Agon, Alea, Mimicry, and Evens. Agon is fundamentally competition, both against others and against challenges. Sports are a form of agon. The most popular item that is not an agon is, of course, the ball. However, many others exist, like sport equipment, board games, and puzzles. According to Kewa, Alea comprehends all play based on chance and randomness. Gambling, of course, is the biggest type of Alea, but elements of Alea are present also in many other games. Items related to Alea, therefore, are generally random generators, as dice, playing cards, coins, spinning cups, and time maps that are of a random value. Evings is the ancient Greek word for dizziness, vertigo. According to Kewa, to Evings pertain, pertain all the kinds of play that involve a rapid and or spinning movement, which produce a state of dizziness in the player. Items related to Evings would therefore be trampolines, blades, carousels, roller coasters, ice skates, hockey sticks, skateboards, and so on. The last form of play is mimicry, which involves imitation and disguise. <coughs> Role playing, construction sets, and carnival are just a few of the many phases of mimicry. The variety of items related to mimicry is far bigger than the others and include construction sets, dolls and minifigures, costumes and masks, and replicas of objects. These four forms of play aren't exclusive. A rugby ball, for example, thanks to its form, bounces in an unpredictable way, and so it's both a form of agon and alien. Carousels, on the other way, often involves both mimicry and illness. This brief overview of the items commonly used for play gives us an idea of their number, variety, and differences. Some of them are undoubtedly toys, but many others are not. Toys are items used for play, but not all items used for play then are toys. The Oxford Dictionary defines toys as <coughs> an object for a child to play with. Typically, a model or a miniature replica of something. 
this definition, both sequence prime anomalies, a childish one, and underline a characteristic, being a replica of something else. This restrictive definition of toys thus comprehends only toys that belong mainly to a form of imitative mimicry, and that features are free, unregulated, and created by behavior. You want to play well in five years. As in addition, we can possibly avoid to notice that the definition of toys as an object that stands for something to children in a playful way is very close to the first definition of sign, being something that stands for something to someone in some capacity. Toys are signs, but of a particular kind. The philosopher Eugen P. wrote in Policies of Happiness that toys have different values according to the point of view adopted. Seen from outside play, toys are perceived as a commodity, an object covering the function of entertaining children. On the other hand, toys seen from inside play have some magic feature that transform them into something else, something more. In other words, we can state that toys acquire their meaning only to their audience and only when play. Things magic, being not in and semiosis. If toys are science, then they can be used to communicate as a part of a particular play playful language. In the second half of my presentation, I will try to outline some of these language features. According to Oxford's definition of toys being replica of something, we can assume that they consist in hypoiconic signs, imitating some of the features of their model. The degree of resemblance between toys and models, however, can vary a lot. As also things underlying in this work, a toy is not always manufactured. Also, a stone or a stick can be used as toys, bending their meaning in a fair resemblance with some human artifact. A useful theory for analyzing that hypoiconic sign comes from Yuri Lockman. In his paper, Dolls in the System of Culture, the founder of cultural semiotics investigates the links between dolls and statues. According to him, the main difference between these two objects is the amount of details that they feature. Statues have many details in order to convey their artistic message, while dolls have less details, leaving to the player the freedom of completing their meaning. Also, the amount of details in toys, however, is changeable and meaningful. Using remarked terminology, we can say that the less detailed minifigures mini represent patterns. They don't have any thematic role, but they can fulfill basically any position in the attention role, in the attention model. Like, for example, this Playmobil, that can be a king or an evil, it can be a protagonist or an antagonist, it can be a cowboy or a knight, a knight, everything. More detailed minifigures have thematic roles that simplify their possible actions, attention roles, and associated figures. Like this cowboy here, it would be his opponents would be probably Indians, his helpers would, would be probably horses, etc. Finally, the most detailed minifigures represent actors, single unique characters fitted with their ideologies and by coordination. As Batman, who would be Norman, uh, the hero that got them. This hierarchy fits also for non anthropomorphic toys. A sword, for instance, could represent a generic weapon, a pirate sword, or King Arthur's Excalibur. Many toy signs don't have discrete parts, and thus are fixed and impossible to change for the player. Some of them, however, have a modular nature at Lego that allows the player to create an, an infinite number of new signs, even if sometimes of difficult interpretation. For the syntax, the syntax of, playful, of the playful toy language is indeed peculiar. These languages, in fact, are shaped as idiolects. Each player owns a particular set of toy signs that is exploited to communicate. If it is long, the language system features a limited number of signs. The power is even more limited. Every sign is unrepeatable and it can be used, used only once in each text. Otherwise, the player should own different tokens of the same toy. Each test, or each play session, is articulated in two moments. In the first one, the toys are chosen and arranged in space or distributed between the players. In the second, the disposition generates action. The 
that is approved, used, is assembled, sometimes destroyed. The first phase is a psychotic act of creativity and is highly meaningful. Eric Erickson in Toys and Reason, when the children playing with toys always create a scene. The reciprocal position of toys and so of sign in the scene shapes the links and relationships between all the signs and is thus meaningful. The second phase is more dynamic. As the scene evolves, the relationship and meanings of toys change. The initial situation becomes the starting point of an oration. For the semantics, at the first time, uh, the meaning of toy science seemed to be seen through their model object. A toy guitar's reference is a real guitar. A Superman minifigure represents the fictional actor of Superman, and so on. However, as we have said about, Less detailed toys are open to many interpretations. Some of them consist in mere actants that will be able to fulfill any of the functions desired by the player. This versatility of toy science is necessary to remedy that the ownership limitation of science. With only a limited number of versatile toy science, then, the player will be able to convey many different messages. Finally, toy science appears to have also a metaphoric nature. Winnicott, in play in reality, say that children playing reenact the ideas they offer for their lives. This representation, however, is never explicit, but proceeds by metaphors. In other words, the player operates a double communication that in one level seems to be about the scene and events that occur in the play, but in a deeper level express the feelings of the player himself. For the pragmatist, playing with choice mainly assumes two forms. The form of a monologue, in which the player plays alone, and the form of an apparent dialogue, in which children play together. <clears throat> when alone, a player is focused on his activity and doesn't need or generally want an audience. The player chooses alone the toys to use and starts to build this scene. Winnicott, as a therapist, writes that it's very useful to watch a child play in order to understand. Anyway, he continues, the child is not trying to communicate with therapist, but more likely with himself, with its own observing ego. On the other hand, in order to play together, a contact is generally made. Do you want to play with me? And a team chosen. Then the players proceed with the distribution, or sometimes appropriation, of toys. This phase is very delicate, because the distribution of toys is also a distribution of communicative power, and the player left with no toys would not be fully able to participate in the play. It is also important to underline that even if it involves a great deal of communication between the players, playing together is closer to an activity of a co-authorship, in which each player tries to create his own message according to his scenes and sharing his toys with the other. In conclusion, playing with toys, even if in company, seems to be an activity close to dream, in which the player exploits a set of sides playfully fulfill an instance of self-reflection. Toy play pertains therefore to a culturally relevant activity that London defines auto-communication. According to him, a quote, in the I-I system, the bearer of the information remains the same, but the message is reformulated and acquires new meaning during the communication process. This is the result of introducing a supplementary second code. The original message is recorded into elements of its structure and thereby acquires features of a new message. The II system qualitatively transforms the information, and this leads to a restructuring of the actual I itself. In this case, about toys, the second code is the language of toys, and according to this point of view, these peculiar rules and limitations that we have analyzed today are meant to complicate the recording possibly allowing you meaning to write.
but I mean, we have really fast to do it. So, can we put it, please? So, uh, there was a quite formal play made on uh, the sensation that um, the player feels when he plays. Uh -huh. The first one is agonist competition, also against puzzles, is trying to achieve something. Mm -hmm. For example, sports, but also board games are part of agonist. Area is about chance. Uh -huh. So, it's the waiting for from a result given by a page. So, for example, gambling, oh, okay. you play, play cards, or Actually, and ceilings mm -hmm. is about dizziness, vertigo. So, for example, spinning around yourself or going uh, to do the bar, it involves ceilings. So, losing oneself uh, body connection, let's say. Mm -hmm. And mimicry is imitation, and uh, <coughs> um, it involves both uh, pretending to be someone, like playing uh, and using toys like puppets to recreate scenes. And so it's more about losing one identity. Do you agree with this division? I like the division, I don't like how we made it. Because um, you also say, for example, that um, Alea and Mimifi can't work together. And this is not true because, for example, in our role playing, other role playing game, you have dice and role playing, so it's not. And I was speaking with uh, Fontani the other day because he spoke about um, basic uh, elementary semiotic moods that was uh, astonishment, luck, nonsense, and fullness. And I think that they are kind of related with these four forms. So I will try to work on this and find if there is some parallel or some. Um, Relationship between these semiotic schools and the four forms of play. Thank you. What? I just want to ask you about your previous work on this kind of forms. Nowadays, there is a lot of people working on games. Not a lot of people working on semiotics of video games, but game studies are really a uh, discipline now. Really. So many people work on them. Yeah. Early games, they got new things in their Facebook or But the problem of these studies, in my opinion, is that what they try to say is okay, video games are new, let's focus on that and forget all the rest. And this doesn't work for me. They are explicitly mediatetic. And sometimes it's, ah, this happens only in video games. It's not true, because it happens so it's good. It so the aim of this is to uh, see the reflections of this. Yeah, this, this would be the next step, trying to find the connection between analog play and uh, digital play. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. According to the middle. For example, it's very interesting uh, now uh, the Lego movie has come out, and in the same moment that the movie came out, a video game came out and construction set. So toys are moving and a video game with the same actors, with the same characters, with the same scenes. This is really interesting also about transmedia. Do you think that's in Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three dimensional uh, space. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do that, Yeah. yeah.